Hey, so continuing off on with our discussion of chapter 14 on elementary particles, um, I really want to move on now and talk about the four forces and their mediating particles. So the four fundamental forces, in case you hadn't heard by now, are the strong force and the nuclear force is kind of a residual force of the strong force. We'll talk more about that later. The electromagnetic force, um, the weak force, and the gravitational force. Now, the strong force is, of course, responsible for holding nuclei together. Um, the electromagnetic force is due to the forces, uh, attractive forces between opposite charges, repulsive forces between like charges, and so on and so forth. Um, the weak force is responsible for beta decay and quark flavor changing, which we'll talk more about later. And then the gravitational force, hopefully you're really familiar with, and it's the attractive force between particles that have mass. And if you're interested, there is, of course, a BuzzFeed quiz um, that you um, can click on. I included the link here um, that's also a credit to the image. And you can find out which of the four fundamental forces you are um, so that's, that's really a nice time waster if you're interested in that. Now, one of the things we're going to be talking about today is that forces between particles, no matter what the force, are often described in terms of um, the actions of field particles or exchange particles. These field particles are also called gauge bosons. Um, they're integer spin, um, so they're bosons. The interacting particles are actually continually emitting and absorbing the field particles. So you can kind of imagine um, the force as only acting on particle B from particle A when particle A throws the field force to particle B, particle B catches it, and in so doing, that creates the force between those two particles. So the exchange particles, the field particles, are the mediators of the force. They carry the force from particle A to particle B. Now the emission of a field particle by one particle and its absorption by the other manifests itself as the force, and that makes them the mediators, okay? so. What are these mediating particles? Well, for the strong force, um, the mediating particle is the gluon. For the electromagnetic force, the mediating particle is the ever familiar photon. For the weak force, there's two mediating particles, and those are the W and Z bosons. And for gravity, the mediating particle is the graviton. You might also hear um, the residual strong force or the nuclear force having a mediating particle that we're going to talk about called the pion and we'll discuss that more in this lecture. Now the gravitational force, um, probably the most familiar to all of you, it's um, holding the planets, stars, and galaxy together. It binds the universe. Its effect on elementary particles that we're going to talk about in this chapter is actually pretty negligible, um, but it is the one that binds the galaxy together even though it really is the weakest of all the four fundamental forces, about 10 to minus 43 times smaller than, than the strength of the strong force. Um, so I kind of think of this as a very sort of Lord of the Rings-ish or Captain America kind of analogy, right? Because the weakest force of all is the one that controls the fate of the universe. What do you think? Does that work? No, I don't know. Anyway, the weakest of all is actually the strongest of us all. Okay, now you might have heard pretty exciting news in the world of physics that the graviton was finally detected and that that was reported on this year. And so that happened at this facility, which we discussed in Modern One, called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Um, and these facilities are interferometers, which have arms that are about five miles long. Um, so they're really impressive facilities. The whole thing is an ultra high vacuum. And basically Basically, you shoot laser beams down those two long arms and then bring them back and watch how the signals interfere with one another. Um, you have to have multiple facilities um, so that you make sure that you're not just getting a signal from one source and then you, you use the information from both facilities to try and triangulate where the emission of the gravitational wave came from. Now it's important to realize that these gravity waves are really small and um, a strong gravitational wave would only produce displacements on the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters, which is about 1,000 times smaller than the diameter of a proton. Okay, so that's, we're talking tiny. Um, and waves of this 
tiny, tiny wavelength um, are actually produced by um, very, very strong gravity <laughs> signals. Something like um, massive systems undergoing large accelerations or black holes crashing into one another. And these things, these events are rare and they're going to be many, many light years away. So it was actually pretty tough to find a gravitational wave. You should be super impressed. Um, but they did it. Um, the results were reported on February 11th, 2016, when LIGO announced the first ever detection of gravitational waves. And this only happened after LIGO underwent about five years of work and upgrades. Um, and scientists predicted that with all these this hard work and these upgrades, that they might be able to detect um, the first gravity waves by 2016. But what happened is, pretty much as soon as they turned everything on and got it all going on the morning of September 14th, 2015, as soon as the system was up, they got these huge signals from both detectors in Louisiana and Washington. You can imagine how excited they must have they must have been. And then they spent the next several months just absolutely analyzing their data to death to make sure that it was what they thought it was. And then finally on February 11th, they made the official announcement. So what happened? Well, it turns out that um, they believe that about 1.4 billion years ago, there were a pair of black holes circling each other in a distant galaxy that finally collided. Um, and the collision of those two black holes, which were respectively about 29 and 36 times more massive than the sun um, produced a huge amount of energy in a fraction of a second, um, an equivalent of about 50 times the power of the entire visible universe in one fraction of a second, and that produced the gravity waves that got detected here in September of 2015. So it's pretty impressive. Um, the next force, the electromagnetic force, is of course responsible for the binding of the atoms and the molecules um, that make you up. It's about 10 to the minus 2 times the strength of the nuclear force. Um, it's also, just like gravity, infinite in range. It's a, a very long range force. It decreases in strength as the inverse square of the separation between your interacting particles. Um, it's fun to note that uh, the path to the grand unification of all the four forces actually started with James Clerk Maxwell, who took Maxwell's equations, added one little displacement current on the end to one of the um, four equations, solved them simultaneously to show that light is an oscillating electromagnetic field. And when he did that, whether he knew it or not, when he did that, he proved that the photon is the exchange particle for the electromagnetic force. And this was the first important step in the quest for the theory of everything. So he took what used to be thought of as two separate forces and proved that they really are one force, which then became known as the electromagnetic force. Grand unification started with Maxwell. Now I'm going to show all these groovy little diagrams in a few minutes. They're called Feynman diagrams, um, and they were invented by Richard Feynman, an American physicist. He actually developed the field, which is now known as quantum electrodynamics, and he invented Feynman diagrams. He won the Nobel Prize in 1965 for his work on quantum electrodynamics, which is also known as QED. He did a lot of important work as a physicist during the time. During his time, he worked on the Manhattan Project, which of course was um, led, worked on the development of nuclear weapons. He worked on the Challenger investigation. Um, and he also wrote some really funny books, which you should read in your spare time. They're autobiographies. He talks about some of his involvement in the Manhattan Project. But the guy just had a great sense of humor. And he was a prankster. And so it's really fun to read his autobiographies. Um, one of my favorites is called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Um, so you should read it. He also wrote the Feynman Lectures, um, which are really nice supplement to helping people conceptualize and understand introductory physics. So um, they're a good read too if you need a little help um, with your homework. So Feynman diagrams are a graphical representation of the interaction between two particles, um, of course named after Richard Feynman. What it is, is kind of a qualitative graph of time on the vertical axis and space on the horizontal axis. The actual values aren't really important. It's not to scale or anything. But it helps provide a pictorial representation of the process. So without further ado, this is what a Feynman diagram looks like. So what's shown here are two electrons kind of approaching each other, right? And then as they get closer together, because they're like charges, of course, um, they want to repel. And so that information gets transmitted 
transmitted by the mediating particle, which is the photon. Now, when the photon acts as a mediator and isn't separated out and detected, they call them a virtual photon. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a photon that you don't actually detect on a detector, but you know had to be transmitted from one to another because the force acted between the two particles. So the electrons were approaching one another, they feel the repulsive force, and then they move apart. And that's um, what is depicted here in this Feynman diagram. Okay, so it seems, if you think about it, that the existence of a virtual photon should violate conservation of energy. Okay, because what would happen is one electron would have to emit a photon which has been transmitted to the other and you would think that that would cause that electron to lose HC over lambda of energy um, and it doesn't do that. So that seems counterintuitive. What's really happening though is that um, electron one emits HC over lambda and then electron two talks back to it and so they're being exchanged constantly. So as long as the rate of exchange and the time of exchange um, is less than the time dictated by the uncertainty principle, delta E, delta T is approximately equal to H bar. As long as that happens, then conservation of energy isn't truly violated. So as long as your time delta T is short enough, delta E is not violated, uh, the conservation of energy isn't violated according to that uncertainty principle. Okay? So there you have it. <laughs> the next force is the weak force. Now this is the one that I think most students find the most confusing, but that's just because it's probably the least familiar. You can sort of conceptualize what the strong force, the electromagnetic force, and gravity do, um, but it's tough to figure out and wrap your head around what the weak force does. So here's what the weak force does. It's responsible for beta decay processes. We talked about beta decay um, in the previous chapter as being a form of radioactive decay where a proton can turn into a neutron or vice versa. Okay, and uh, when that happens, it emits an electron or a positron and a neutrino. Okay, and that's the, the radiation. Well, the weak force is what's responsible for that. Now, it's called the weak force, but it's actually not the weakest of all the four fundamental forces. That's gravity, um, but it's weaker than the strong force, so they call it the weak force. Who knows why people do things? I, I can't tell you. Um, the weak force acts between um, leptons, it acts in the decay of hadrons, more about particle classifications later. And the reason that um, beta decay happens is actually because uh, both protons and neutrons are made up of uh, two flavors of quarks called up and down quarks. They're the most common in ordinary matter. And you just need one quark, one up or down quark, to switch to the other kind of quark in order for a proton or a neutron to decay into the other one. Okay, And so that's what happens. The weak force is responsible for quark flavor changing. Um, and more about quarks and more about all that later, but that's what the weak force does. Okay. Now, um, these three guys right here, Salam, Glashow, and Weinberg, what they did was in the 1960s, they won the Nobel Prize. Uh, they, they worked to unify the uh, electromagnetic and the weak force. And then they won the Nobel Prize in 1979 for their work. They came up with a theory um, that predicted the existence of the mediating particle for the weak force. So they predicted the existence of the W and Z bosons. And these particles really weren't observed until 1983, but the theory predicted reality so well that they went ahead and gave them the Nobel Prize in 1979. What the theory does is it postulates that the weak and electromagnetic interactions have the same strength when the particles involved have very high energies, um, and that they're viewed as two different manifestations stations of a single unifying electroweak interaction. Now, this is kind of a common thread for the unification of the forces. The idea of grand unification theory and string theory and a lot of other stuff is that in the beginning of the universe, um, just a few fractions of a second after the Big Bang, all forces were really one. And they could all exist as one force at that time because the universe was so incredibly hot and so incredibly dense that it defies any imagination that we really have. And when 
the conditions in the universe are like that, then all the four forces are the same because everything's packed so tight that they have all about the same range and everything is so hot that the interaction energies are so large that you really can't tell one force from another. And then as the universe co uh, cooled down and got less dense, um, the uh, four forces began to separate off. Okay, The strong force was the first to separate off and then so on and so forth after that. Okay, And so their idea is that the electromagnetic and the weak force actually unified together. If you can make the conditions hot enough and dense enough, then you'll see them reunified. And that's um, what happened. Now here's your Feynman diagram for the weak interaction. Basically here uh, you have an electron and a neutrino and they're interacting with one another via the weak force um, and they're using the Z particle here to uh, show that mediating particle. Um, and then if you want to observe uh, a gauge boson, what you have to do is break the symmetry. So you have to get them to interact, but then before that particle can reach the other one, you have to break the symmetry and then the particle will move off and it can be detected. And that's what happened in 1983 at CERN, which you've probably heard of. All right, the nuclear force, the next one that I want to talk about. This is actually a residual strong force. We'll talk more about that in a coming lecture, um, but, uh, but it's sort of the leftover strong force in a nucleus. It's causing the attractive force between nucleons, and of course the strong force is the strongest of all fundamental forces. It's really super short-ranged, as we discussed. It only acts on distances of about a femtometer, and it really is negligible for separations greater than this. The theory of the nuclear force um, was uh, first postulated, developed, laid out in theory by Hideki Yukawa, who's a Japanese physicist who died in 1981. He won the Nobel Prize in 1949 for predicting the existence of the mesons that mediate the nuclear force. And he developed the first theory to help explain the nature of the nuclear force. So mesons um, were from the theory to explain the nuclear force. He used the idea of forces being mediated by particles to explain that nuclear force. And he had to introduce a new particle um, whose exchange between the nuclei caused the nucleons caused the nuclear force. And he called that particle a meson. He probably ended with an O-N just to have symmetry with proton and neutron and everything else. Um, so there you have it. Now the proposed particle um, that he came up with would have a mass about 200 times greater than the electron. And in the 1930s, they made some efforts to establish the existence of this particle. Because they didn't have a particle accelerators at the time, they used cosmic rays um, to, to study it. And then when they did this, they actually discovered multiple particles. The pi meson, or pion for short, um, which ended up being the mediator of the nuclear force. And then they also discovered the muon. And that's the one where the guy said, who ordered that? Okay, um, The muon was actually found first. It was determined not to be the pi meson that they were looking for. In fact, the reason that they detected the muon is because the pion has a really short lifetime, and the pathway for the decay of the pion is into a muon and then some other particles. Okay, So that's why they found the muon, but it really wasn't what they were looking for, and they found the pion a little later. So there's three varieties of pions we know now, and it corresponds to three charge states. You can have a neutral pion, a positively charged pion, or a negatively charged pion. Each, um, each of the positive and negatively charged pions have masses of about 139.6 MeV per C squared. Um, and then, of course, they have their own corresponding antiparticles. The pi zero is its own antiparticle, and its mass is 135 MeV per C squared. These are super unstable particles. The pion decays into a muon and an antineutrino in just about 26 nanoseconds, so they don't last very long. So pions decay into muons. There's two muons. Um, the uh, regular matter muon is, has a negative charge, and then its antiparticle is uh, positively charged. And they have mean lifetimes on the order of 2.2 microseconds, which is why probably they were detected first. They have longer lifetimes than the pion. So the muon, when it finally does decay, decays into an electron, a neutrino, and an antineutrino. Um, as is depicted, actually, no, the pions decay is depicted here.
So here was um, the Feynman diagram showing Yukawa's model. You have your proton and your neutron and they're acting together um, and the exchange particle there is the pion and that's why the nuclear force um, acts the way that it does because it's exchanging this mediating particle. Now this existence of the pion is allowed in spite of the conservation of energy as long as the times are short because remember they're tossing these uh, exchange particles back and forth. So as long as this happens at a fast enough rate then, um, then you're good to go on energy conservation. You can use this uncertainty principle um, and the idea of what the range of the nuclear force is roughly to estimate what the mass is. And this is how they made those estimates of what the mass of the pion really should be. Um, to give you an idea about how we do this, the range, the maximum distance the pion could travel is going to be equal to the speed of light times that time of its existence, delta t. So that's of course an upper limit. So r would approximately be equal to c delta t. And really it would be, you know, of course less than that because anything with mass can't travel at the speed of light. So this place is an upper limit. So here if you realize that the nuclear force's max range is on the order of a femtometer, 10 to the minus 15 meters or so, and then you set that equal to c delta t, and then you solve for delta t using the uncertainty principle, delta e delta t is approximately equal to h bar over 2. So then you plug in there um, using your uncertainty principle for what delta t is and you have c delta t is equal to h bar c over 2 delta e and then you realize that your uncertainty in the energy has to be on the order of the uh, rest energy of the particle, right? So then you plug in um, there and you can solve using what you think your range is for what this rest energy of the particle should be. Now using this, the rest energy of the pion, just in my simple little estimate, should be about 100 MeV. And as we saw, the rest energy of the pion is at actually around 140 MeV. So this is a pretty good estimate. Now Yukawa's approximations were better than this and he estimated on the order of 130 MeV and then the real answer turned out to be about 140 MeV. So there you go, there's this Nobel Prize. So this nuclear interaction says, this concept says, that a system of two nucleons can exchange um, into two nucleons plus a pion uh, can change into two nucleons plus a pion as long as it returns to its original state in a very short time interval. And it's often said that the nucleon is undergoing fluctuations as it absorbs and emits these field particles. And this is how it is modeled by quantum electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, and special relativity. Now historically, um, the nuclear force was called the strong force, but now we reserve the term strong force for the force between quarks, which we'll talk about in an upcoming lecture, um, or particles made from quarks. The nuclear force is the force between nucleons, but because the quarks within the nucleon are bound so tightly together, um, most of the strong force is used up there. And so you sort of have the leaked out strong force being the nuclear force that's responsible for the force between nucleons, and that's called the residual strong force. Okay, so um, that's it for this lecture on our mediating particles and um, the four fundamental forces. Next we're going to talk about classifications of particles and we'll get into quarks and leptons and all those fun names that I threw at you today. If you have any questions, let me know.